Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And uh, it's always nice to see a, an alumni from IBM. It's kind of one of those jokes. You say you work for IBM, I was like, oh, I had this friend or this cousin or whoever that worked at IBM. So I'm thrilled to be here today. And I'm excited to talk to you about sort of the next era, the cognitive era, um, and what IBM has been doing around the education space. So first, I want to tell you just a little bit more about what I do and what my role is at IBM. Um, if you break down my title, developer engagement, um, when we focus on the developer, the developer comes in many flavors, right? The developer could be in the enterprise. It could be in a startup. The developer could be in a school as a student. So when you think about those three cohorts, it's really important that we understand what types of offerings and um, what types of technology do we want to bring to those communities. Um, and when we think about the second part of the word, engagement, engagement is any way that these developers may interact with our products, our services, with our experts. Um, so when I um, look at sort of my whole organization, I find that my remit is focused on how do I get these developers offline to online and how, what is their digital experience. Um, and then I have a number of different programs that we focus on specifically for ed tech um, and also our startups. Um, and we really hope that we can help to supply them with the technologies that they need to build innovative solutions for the future. So arguably I have the best job at IBM. Uh, it's pretty exciting, and, um, but I'm jazzed to be here. This is one of my most favorite spaces. So um, let's talk a little bit about what is happening in the cognitive era. So I want to take you back a little bit um, and talk about what IBM um, has defined as sort of these three eras. And in the last hundred years, we've seen a number of different um, you know, technology shifts that have happened. And this first era that we talk about is really around the tabulating systems era. And think about things like punch cards. If you don't know a lot of history about IBM, um, it was all the way back, you know, meat grinders, punch cards, all kinds of uh, technology. But those were still machines. So thinking about tabulating machines um, and how we may move into sort of the next era of programmable um, systems. You know, in these systems, think about going from a tabulating type of machine to electronic systems, right? And this, this really started to evolve around World War II, where, um, you know, the military and science was really reliant on technology to bring scale around businesses and society. And from there, we move into what IBM has coined the cognitive era. I think about this era as systems that help us to see things that were previously invisible. That could be things like unstructured data. That could be dark data. How do we use technology um, to get better insights and analytics out of that data? So IBM is calling this the cognitive era. Um, and of course, um, our major solution for that is, is IBM Watson. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that as I go through. Um, but first, I want to you know, just openly talk about the, the elephant in the room. And I get a lot of questions around, well, you know, our machines and AI going to take over our lives and our jobs and, you know, come down upon us and all of these things. And, you know, it's a valid concern. Um, but what I want to talk about is IBM's position in this space. So I'd like to show you a quick video of, um, that features our CEO um, and chairman, Ginny Rometty. And she talks a lot about how the AI era is really about man and machine, not man versus machine. And she does a much better job of uh, explaining this. So I'll let you watch this quick video. I'm joined this morning by Ginny Rometty, CEO of IBM. Ginny, right. you have a lot of meetings, a lot of, a lot of your major uh, clients are governments yep. uh, uh, from Europe and around the world. What's, what, are they, what are they telling you about? What, what are their expectations for investment for the next year or so? Well, and many of them are looking, you know, you look at any, any country in the world, the discussion is about jobs and investment. And so it's really how can you help them move into the next era? And so everyone's looking to build skills for the next generation in this next era. And so everyone that is at the heart of the discussion is investments, but that also build skills. And many of us, Jerry, I think we have a responsibility to help in this era of building the right skills for what's going to need to lead in the next generation. And as you say, jobs do seem to be this very much a concern, uh, even as much as excitement as there is about technology, there's concern uh, in many parts of the world. 
uh, about the loss of jobs associated with the introduction of some new technologies. To some extent, that's behind some of the insecurity that we've seen that's led to some of these dramatic political developments in Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, what are you telling governments about how technology can uh, not only improve economic performance, but what, what, what it can do for jobs? Yeah, th this is actually one of the most important topics and another one of, in addition to why I'm here, because there's both a macro and a micro discussion around this. Because at a macro level, there's many job openings that are out there. At a micro level, if someone doesn't have the skill or hasn't been, has been displaced, that's a problem. And so what we've, and I've had the discussion on is, I think, three things. One is that this is really a call to action to change education and to match the curriculums with what's going to be needed in these jobs. Because this isn't going to be an era of man versus machine. It will be man and machine. We've had experience now with thousands of these with clients. It is this symbiotic relationship in this new era of AI. And it will be in service of man and helping what you and I do make it better. And so one is that's going to call for you know, jobs in education and education that matches those. And therefore, what we'll do is, and, and I think this is an important point. This is not just about high-skilled jobs. This is about changing fundamental education because there's many things you can do without a four-year degree. So one is, and we've been in, uh, quite vocal about this, pathways to technology and creating new-collar jobs that you can do this with less than a four-year degree. The next thing, though, is all of us doing retraining. And we do massive amounts of retraining. And then the third thing is these technologies, they can help you do a job that you couldn't do before. I mean, I see many of the banks we work with in a call center. These are complex products. They're having to answer questions. And with these technologies, everyone is able to answer and do a better job. It, I actually think they're going to make you a better version of yourself and allow us as humans to do what we do best. And you're going to see a beneficial impact from whether how a teacher teaches your child. Do they know if they have a disability learning math, the right lesson plan to use, to the other end of the spectrum that we're rolling out now, Oncology Advisor in India and Chiland in, in uh, Italy and Finland, to doing clinical trial matching, genomic sequencing, precision medicine. So. The upsides there, I think, to solve some of what have been the world's most difficult problems, and a lot of the discussion here, are really within our graphs, and it's just the beginning of an era for this. So just to reiterate, I mean, I, I really, first of all, she's one of the most eloquently spoken uh, executives I've ever seen speak. And um, she's really on this point, though, that, again, it's about man and machine, and when we think about um, you know, what humans are good at. We're good at things like imagination. We're good at things like empathy. When we think about machines and what AI can do, it's really about, um, you know, recognizing patterns in machine learning. You put those things together, um, they can't, they have to coexist. We, it, it's not about one um, eliminating the other. And even though our chairman, who you saw, this was a very recent video, um, if you look all the way back to one of our former CEOs, um, Thomas J. Watson Jr., this is, this is a quote from uh, 1956, and, and he says, um, computing will never rob man of his initiative or replace the need for creative thinking. By freeing man from the more menial or repetitive forms of thinking, computers will actually increase opportunities for the full use of human reason. So this has always been our point of view. Um, so going into the AI era, um, you know, we, we expect to see um, the same strategy. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the change in, in the technology industry, which of course is affecting many industries. Um, so when we think about the proliferation of data now, um, it's all around us. It is in everything that we do. And there's a very um, gray area now between how we experience technology in our personal lives and how we experience that technology in our professional lives. It's embedded into everything that we do. So if we look at a few stats, um, when we think about you know, the smartphone, 1.2 million lines of code now in the smartphone. We think about even something as simple as a pacemaker, 80,000 lines of code now in a pacemaker. When we think about even the automobile industry, for a, a smart car now, we have over 100 you know, million lines of code in, in just a, an automobile. 
Um, and when we think about something like a smart appliance, a, a microwave, over five million lines of code. So it's pervasive. It is across everything that we do. So when we think about these things that are surrounding us all, all day, um, what does that mean for, for industry? Um, it's transforming industries, and of course, education is, is no, no different. But when you think about um, you know, what type of global disruption we're seeing across industries, I mean, you know, demand for talent I mean, we, we see the chasm between the demand of jobs that there are in the industry and the talent we have to fill those, and it will just get, you know, snowball over time. Um, we think about the quality of those skills, you know, are we filling those jobs just because we need warm bodies, or are those people really, truly the talent that we need in those roles? Um, governments are overwhelmed, and of course, institutions like yourselves are struggling to change at the rate of pace. Um, and when we look at a, a similar study that was done by IBM, um, you know, 50% um, of academic and business leaders um, believe that um, they're not able to meet the demands of students, that they're not able to meet the demands of industry and meet the demands of society. That's a huge burden. I mean, those are people like yourself saying that you're struggling now on, on how are we going to evolve quickly and pivot our enterprise at the same rate of change as the industry. Um, and so what I'd like to show you is a little bit about, you know, if we look at the top level um, growth, right, for technology, and we look at this, the rate of pace that organizations are able to change, what we have in the middle is really a gap around the student experience. And these students, right, I mean, they are out there. This data and this technology is really affecting, you know, the way that we interact with information, the way that we purchase, and certainly the way that we learn, right? So when we think about the student experience, um, they're out there having these highly technical interactions and experiences every day. Um, they expect that same level of experience when they're learning, right? So um, the rate of change is, is really picking up. Um, so when we think about education as an industry, um, you know, we have to meet the needs of, of sort of the demands, right? Enterprises like myself, I'm hiring all kinds of different roles. So there's really this exchange of, of value um, and information that has to happen, right? Um, we need to, as enterprises and partners, be able to share with you where we see these jobs going. Um, and in turn, we hope that the curriculum sort of pivots in that same direction. Um, so when we think about you know, aligning um, both industry and, and enterprise. We think about transforming teaching and learning, um, and then we have to think about, well, what does that mean for leading in the cognitive era? And, you know, it's interesting, I, I sort of, you know, go and interact with many different types of industries, um, and it's all the same. Um, the application of it may be very different, but when I look at the challenges in retail, when I look at the challenges in banking and finance, when I look at the challenges in education, Everybody is still trying to get ahead, right? They're still trying to use technology to, you know, beat out their competition or get better insights. Um, so I'd like to just leave you with this a little bit. I think it's a nice way to explain uh, what we mean by cognitive. Um, and IBM has sort of coined this term. The industry uses AI. We've said cognitive, you know, era. Um, but there's really three layers when we think about um, you know, uh, what we call the cognitive system overall. Um, the first is around cognitive computing, and really think about that as um, things like a computer playing chess or um, interacting with a chatbot. And then we go a layer deeper into artificial intelligence. And then when you get a layer deeper into machine learning, this is really a, like deep learning and learning um, a machine learning from those own, their own data sets, creating new data sets, right? So there's really three different layers. And it's really important that when you're deciding on what your strategy is going to be around building a cognitive system, that you know where you want to start. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing within Watson Education specifically. Um, so I'll kick it off with this quick video. The best education isn't in a book or on a blackboard. It's in the mind of each individual learner. And when educators understand what lights up that mind, what a fourth grader loves, who a high school senior wants to be, where a professional wants to go, something powerful happens. Education transforms from something you have to learn to something you want to know. IBM Watson Education makes this possible by taking personalized learning to a whole new level. 
We are building solutions and applications for educators and learners that understand what engages every individual. Educators get a holistic view of students to help understand what works best for every learner. We offer solutions that have been designed with teachers for teachers to deliver personalized education for learners at every stage of life. With IBM Watson, we can match passions to pathways and abilities to achievements. So I love that video, but I have to tell you, when I first heard that video, I was a bit creeped out because I thought that sounded like my voice. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else knows. But when she started talking, she's like, I be in Watson Education. I was like, that sounds like me. It's really weird. Um, but what I love about that video is it really talks about not just the, um, the student in K through 12 or higher ed or, or beyond that, but it's really about sort of this continual learner. And we're really focused on this space. And it's not just about you know, coming to uh, you know, a higher ed institution, but we have to set up those students that once they leave, they still have the skills for how they're going to be able to learn. So so um, we're also very focused on the, on the full spectrum. Um, and what I'd like to talk about are sort of these five steps for becoming a, really an AI-driven um, university. And yesterday, we had a, a really great chat, I think a subset of us, and I, I really enjoyed that conversation. And I think the thing that, for me, is um, sort of underpinning all of these, um, these steps and this roadmap that I'll take you through is really the, the partnership, again. I can't emphasize that enough, which is why we're all here today. Um, and I think there are some really great learnings that came out of yesterday, um, specifically that we have to think about non-traditional partnerships. We have to think about, um, even if we're already working together, are there adjacent spaces that we can um, continue to innovate around. Um, but I think this roadmap is, um, um, helps to kind of guide you through, like what are the major steps that you should be thinking about if you're truly wanting to embed AI into your institution? Um, so the first one is around organizational alignment. Um, and this is something that you really have to get buy-in top down. You can do some mini projects that you know, pull in AI services, um, but if you really want to see the full impact of how AI can transform your organization, it has to be pervasive throughout the institution. Um, the second area is really around building an agile environment. So once you bring in um, sort of this new technology, how do we use it? How do we um, use it quickly? How are we able to iterate and, and bring in different types of practices um, that will allow us to really get the value out of that technology? The third area is around having a data strategy. We talked earlier about how important data is becoming in our daily lives. Um, so I'll take you through a little bit about um, how important it is to have a data strategy um, within your organization and how you use that data. Um, the third area is probably one that is um, most interesting, especially to me, um, which is how do we use all of these things to really improve the client, uh, the, I see client, I'm in, see, I'm in my, enterprise, my enterprise mode, um, improve the student experience. Um, and then finally, tomorrow's workforce. Um, and, and I'll tell you a couple personal stories when we get to this section, but um, it's interesting how rapidly the, the young generation is changing. Um, and, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, our intern program that we have. So let's first talk about um, organizational alignment. And you know, it's really about um, everybody has a role to play. So it's got to be kind of everybody together. And that includes the student, right? Um, so when we think about um, organization um, alignment, you know, we've got to first think about what is the vision for the institution. And yesterday we even discussed this in our, in our meeting. Having those aspirational goals of um, we don't want to bring in AI for innovation's sake. We have to really have some strategic goals around that. What is the organization trying to accomplish? Um, and we think about top to bottom commitment. That means every part of the organization really has to be committed to making change and doing that transformation. Um, so what I'd like to talk about, three specific examples um, around where we're seeing this. Um, we have three case studies. Um, M. Leon um, is, is a wonderful example of how they're doing this sort of top to bottom using our IBM Cloud. Um, but Gwinnett County Public Schools, I think, is a really interesting one. Um, so again, in the spirit of being more interactive and exciting, I'm going to show you a quick video about what we're doing there with them.
We built our first vocabulary learning app on the IBM and Sesame Intelligent Play and Learning platform. And for over a two week period, we were able to deliver personalized learning experiences to Gwinnett County kindergartens. By continuously gathering data from the student users, Watson could identify and refine areas that require additional focus. And then it will deliver reinforcement through meaningful and engaging content. That is amazing. How does that little app do all of that? These amazing teachers of Gwinnett County were able to monitor students' vocabulary development in real time through their secured dashboard. Using immediate information, educators can adjust lessons, pacing, and even the curriculum to fit each child's needs. I love that it's individualized. I love that they are learning at their own rate of speed. They are getting new words as rewards. And I love seeing them using it outside of the app. When they see an arachnid, they call it an arachnid now. Wait, did she just say attractive? <laughs> well, uh... I am rather cute and adorable. <laughs> no, Grover, arachnid, you know, a spider. Ah, spider! Where? Where? Oh, oh, please, please, I'm so scared of spiders. Don't worry, Grover. Hmm? It'll be okay. There are no spiders. There are not? No, that's are just... You sure? I am. That's just an example of all of the amazing words children are exploring. Oh. So I show this for a couple of reasons. I know it's a, a bit earlier than the generation that you're working with, but um, I show it to you because this is the future generation, and these are the students that will be coming into your school, um, and these are the experiences they're having already. Um, and what's great about this case study is that, um, again, it was, it was about the county and, and the administration in that school system all the way top to bottom. They had buy-in from administration, from the teachers and the students, and, um, and it, you really see the impact of, of how having that alignment can really do amazing things. Um, I want to take you through a little bit about agile environments. Um, and agile is like one of those buzzwords. It's like, oh, let's be agile. But like, no one really knows what that means. Um, and agile for me is really about instituting a set of practices and standards that help you transform the way that you work within your organization. Um, so think about things like, um, we call it design thinking. It's just a new way of getting at problems, tackling problems. Um, and, and what I love about the Agile methodology is it really stretches people to get out of those repetitive processes that we do every day that sometimes drag us down. Um, so again, here's a, a few um, case studies, if you will. Um, we have um, London South Bank, um, Carnegie Mellon, and again, all of these universities are thinking about the way that they can come at problems in a very different direction and change the style of work. Doing things like MVPs, you know, getting a minimum viable product out. Um, when you have you know, something, let's do two week or three week sprints and let's see what we, come, uh, what we get out of it. What kind of a prototype can we get that we can then iterate on? Um, and this is how I'm doing things within my own organization. Um, and some of my teams here, hopefully they're, they're still happy. Um, but we have really moved to a very agile work style. So all of the projects that we have are in a tool, um, and we set up sprints for those projects. We have scrum masters assigned to those projects, and we have short-term goals. And, and as we hit those goals, it's cause for celebration. It's not like you're just churning on these long-term projects and then six months later it happens and everyone's just happy for it to be over. It's really about getting those sort of short-term milestones. Um, and I want to show you just one example of um, another project that we're doing in-house. And um, as mentioned in my introduction, um, I also lead the partnership with, um, with Girls Who Code, who, which has been one of the coolest things that, um, that I've gotten to work on. Um, so Girls Who Code, um, we're doing some interesting things with them. One is we have these summer immersion programs. And these summer immersion programs are really about um, us bringing our SMEs, our technology, and really allowing them to use that technology during the summer um, and, and sort of get a head start on, um, on their future. And, and many of these girls, I spent um, many hours with them this summer, and they know with certainty they want to be coders. They are dedicated to the cause, they are ready to build, um, and they are dedicating their summers to coming and doing this. Um, and we also have a, a separate program for internships. 
And typically our internships at IBM have been very focused on the higher ed space. Sort of sophomore, junior year, you want to come in, um, do your internship, and, and then continue on to close out your four-year degree. Um, this year, however, was the first year that we invited high school students to come with us for the summer. Um, so here are three of my girls. Um, and they were also members of our summer immersion program. Um, and what was great about this is they really helped to um, really live and breathe by those agile practices that we had instituted in our organization. Um, and I was telling someone last night at the cocktail party that um, we were so excited. We got all of these projects, you know, outlined for them for their six weeks to come here. Day one, they come in and, you know, we gave them a, um, a challenge to build a series of recipes that we were going to feature on our website. And uh, we said, we'd like you to build a chat bot. And it was like, in two days it was done. And we were like, oh shoot, we gotta come up with some other projects because they already like, we're blowing through all these things. But they, the way that they work is very systematic. Um, it's very collaborative. And, and we saw them sort of break out the project into these chunks. And it helped them really move through um, those projects very quickly. Um, so just one example. And if you're interested, you can go on our um, developer.ibm.com slash recipes page. And you can see some, some of their work that's published there. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about data. Having a data strategy, I think, is critically important. Even before you kind of move on to this road of AI, having a foundational understanding of what kind of data you have, where is it, is it secure, how are you going to leverage it, um, it's really important. And you know, at IBM, um, we have a saying that your data is your data. Um, however, not every vendor um, has that same uh, sort of point of view. So I really encourage you to understand that when you are looking at a data strategy, make sure that you're the proprietary owner of that data. I think it's critically important. Um, so when we think about some other case studies, what the universities are doing, um, Australian National, um, Southern Connecticut University, sort of in the tri-state area, um, and then Edith Cowan. Um, and what I think is interesting about Edith Cowan is they had a particular issue around student attrition. And what they looked at were trends in data around enrollment, um, around courses that were taken. Um, and they were able to use some of that predictive analytics to say, you know, based on these student demographics, based on these behavioral patterns, we see that these types of students will, uh, you know, have higher attrition than this other set. Um, and that's the kind of um, insights that this data can do for you. Um, one more just quick example around um, Australian National. Um, again, having a single source of data for reporting. Um, and when you're in a university as, as large as yourself, um, we start to stand up places where data resides that may be disconnected from other areas. So what, what um, this case study did in particular was, how can we get a single source of data across all places where that data is stored? Um, and we use that for better planning with staff and faculty for, for future years. Um, so again, I think having a data strategy is really um, foundational to moving into the cognitive era. OK. so. Student experience, probably the more fun one. Um, you know, when we think about student experience, um, it has to be across many different um, aspects. It has to be sort of their experience in the classroom. It has to be their, ex their experience with a teacher. It has to be their experience with the curriculum. Um, and if that curriculum is based on technology, it has to be their experience interacting with that technology. Um, and we've seen sort of um, the, the experiences that students expect to change over the years. You know, going from sort of a generic type of engagement or experience to, um, you know, more of a personalized experience. Um, so being able to um, use technology to bridge that gap, I think, is really important. So again, just a few um, case studies here. Um, we have um, Deakin um, and also um, Kanazawa um, Institute. And, um, and Brockenhurst. And I think, again, you know, being able to use um, you know, some of this technology to enhance the, the student experience on campus. Um, I was actually, uh, last night, I was uh, at the reception and I was in the ladies' room. And I overheard a conversation of three young students talking about how great the app was 
here at Penn State. And they were you know, all excited. They were like, yeah, this is so great, and I can log in or whatever. And they were talking about that experience. So um, I think it's really important that um, things that happen both in the classroom and outside of the classroom really, really have an impact. Um, so I want to show you just one more video about some of the work that we're doing with Pearson around um, the, the student experience. Learning can propel us from where we are now to places we can only imagine. But with technology, imagination becomes reality. A reality where every learner has access to their own personal virtual tutor at any time, from anywhere. Imagine a tutor that actually learns and understands, like us, but with breathtaking speed and unparalleled scale. Not just facts, but nuance and meaning, and helps every learner master the material by responding to what they know, how they feel, and where they need to go. But it does something else. It helps them learn how to learn, all while gathering data that fuel insights. Insights that help educators inspire learners so they can reach their full potential. Because where learning flourishes, so do people. Imagine the possibilities. So again, I think a, a really cool partnership. And again, you'll see the theme of my presentation is all about doing these, real, these intentional lockups with other partners where um, we bring what we're good at, which is the technology side, and sort of the access to these great communities and, and how we can help to transform those experiences. Um, I want to show you just one more thing. Um, you know, imagine that you're a student and you have um, you know, a forum for which, in which you participate. Some are already, you're already on to me, you already know what I'm going to say. Um, but, you know, if you had a teaching assistant that was um, really a, a chat bot, right? And, and we saw this actually happen at, at one university. Um, so, Georgia Tech. Um, has anyone seen the case study on, on Jill Watson? Yeah. Pretty interesting. Um, if, you if you have a chance, I encourage you to read more about it. But um, there was, um, particularly for this computer science class, a uh, forum set up for students to be able to ask a lot of questions. And it was, it was a lot to respond to. So they experimented. In the class, actually, the curriculum was very much focused around AI. And um, they, they experimented using Jill Watson um, in the back to help respond um, to those real-time questions of students. And the students had no idea until the end of the semester, of course, when it was revealed that this TA was, was actually Watson in the background. So again, another really um, interesting example where um, those menial tasks that take a lot of time for us to do um, help to assist um, the professor in this case um, to, um, to respond to those, those student questions. Okay. Last one, tomorrow's workforce. And this is an area I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, um, it's interesting. I, I talked a little bit about the girls who code earlier. And what was um, so fun about having those girls in for the summer was um, most of them were 16 and 17. And, and when I think about 16 and 17 year olds, I'm thinking, okay, maybe they're worried about sort of, you know, what their back to school clothes are going to be like. You know, these girls were some of the most um, intelligent and hardworking interns that I have ever had. And the amount of output that they gave in that summertime, it, it was like incredible. And we had them actually sitting with our other university interns. And we thought, oh, the, you know, the more senior interns will really help to mentor you know, these young ladies that are coming in. It's their first time. Many of them, first time they had a job. And we did pay them, which went over very well. Um, but we paired them together in sort of this group. And man, they thrived. And it wasn't just the older students mentoring the younger students. It was, in fact, in many cases, the reverse, because that younger generation already, even though it was only four years or so, they were already leapfrogging in terms of the technology that they were using. Very, very interesting. Um, and so for me, I'm thinking about, OK, those girls now are 16 or 17. They, they haven't even gotten to higher ed yet. So when we think about the next generation, those ones that you saw in the Sesame um, case study, um, what, will, what will they be like by the time they get to us? Um, so again, thinking about um, you know, a few different examples here. 
for tomorrow's workforce. Um, P-TECH in, in particular, is anyone familiar with IBM's P-TECH initiative? Yeah, so it's really about um, reaching into schools and focusing again on things like computer science um, and how do we help those students get an accelerated degree um, in high school. And we have a number of P-TECH schools um, around the world now. Um, we recently launched in, in Australia. Um, and I'm, re I'm really proud of this initiative. In fact, I've hired a few um, P-TECH students and um, they come in and they, they do some in, um, internships with IBM and then we invite them to join us full time um, while they you know, complete an associate's degree. Um, and then we encourage their education as they continue to work with us. Um, but again, I had someone who was 18 join my, my team full time uh, last year. Um, and it's a very, very interesting program. Um, and I want to talk about one other, which is our um, Africa Skills Initiative. And earlier this year, we actually launched this, um, you know, in um, uh, the Middle East and Africa. Um, and it's, it's a very cool digital platform, and I encourage you to look at it. Um, but again, different ways of enhancing the student experience. Um, and going back to that organizational um, alignment, you know, we really um, got so much support from the government in this space where we now have a digital platform for students to have access to our IBM Cloud, to our Watson services. Um, they can log in. They have a very personalized learning um, roadmap. Um, and this is just one example. And um, in a few weeks, we're actually going to, to launch 2.0. So stay tuned. It's coming soon. Um, but this is the type of model that um, I'd like to, you know, institute that takes not only learning but badging um, and also interaction across um, different types of education. Students are able to interact on this learning platform. So just another example of, of something we're doing in the education space um, with another um, country. So the good news is that you guys are well on your way. And I'm so excited to hear about what was happening around the Watson Nittany Challenge. Um, and I think later today we're gonna have some, um, some awards, but um, this is the type of innovation that you can start with. Um, and yesterday we talked a lot about, you know, how can we take something that's more tactical, something that's more like a challenge, and really embed that into the way that the university um, is running. And again, thinking about things like partnerships, thinking about how do we take a challenge um, and then build, you know, sort of this silver thread that goes throughout it. If we have a challenge and we have students who then move on to take um, classes where that curriculum is embedded with AI, and those students then become some of the best minds in AI in this university who can compete for internships, for example, at IBM. Um, and those internships help to really give them that real world experience. And maybe they're, they're so encouraged that they want to create um, their own business and become an entrepreneur. How can they move into the innovation hub and then be part of our startup program? So, so these are the things that I'm thinking about now, which is um, how can we use a moment like this and really build a repeatable system? So um, I'm really psyched to see what comes out of these, um, these five finalists. I'll leave you with one thing, which are some resources if you're interested. Um, and, and something that I've been really focused on is how can we make things very consumable? How can we make things easily accessible for all of the cohorts that we talked about? Um, the first one being, you know, code. Again, I'm in the business of developers, right? And many of you are thinking, well, how can I get started? You know, are there certain things that I can pull down and start using in my classroom right away um, or experiment with? The first one, I encourage you to visit our, um, our code page. And on that code page, you'll see a number of different what we call code patterns. And these patterns are aligned by sort of technology area. So if you're interested in blockchain, for example, or you're interested in chatbots, you can go on this page, you can, you know, just immediately click on that journey, um, and it gives you access to a free set of code. You can take that code, you can fork it to GitHub, you can deploy it in the IBM cloud, I hope. Um, you can choose to deploy it in another cloud if you so choose. Um, but these code journeys are really like starter packs. So you can get in, get your hands on the code, and they're really great for using in the classroom. If you want, you know, they come in, they sign up with an ID, and it's just free, and they can just access it as they choose. Um, the second one is really around how can you, um, as uh, educators, be able to pull some of this curriculum down into the classroom? And we have a number of different 
programs available um, and, and promo codes that allow you to use our technology um, for the duration of the semester. So I encourage you um, to sign up and get access to that. Um, and we have some other sort of high touch options where we can come in and do workshops, but I'd be happy to talk to anyone who wants to explore building um, AI into your curriculum. And the final thing is around our cognitive courses. Um, and it's really important that not only are we focused on bringing education to our students, but us, you know, ourselves are educating, um, getting educated on a regular basis. So our cognitive class.ai has a number of um, both data science and AI cognitive courses up there, um, which I encourage you to check out. So um, just some quick resources for you. So I want to thank you so much. This has been great. I look forward to meeting many of you after the session. And uh, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Catherine. OK. So uh, can I just hang, have you hang? We, we sure. have a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Uh, lots of good things there. Uh, we, we have a couple minutes for a question or two from the, from the group. And if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to sort of start us off. One of the points you made was about agility. One of the things that Penn State and IBM have in common is we're, we're rather large. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering what strategies or just an example of one that you have found within your w uh, industry, if you will, your corporation. H how did you grasp the idea of agility and how might we as an institution which is not necessarily known mm -hmm. for being really agile, what can we learn from an experience that you may have had? So I'll just talk quickly about my own organization. Um, I took this job at the end of April this year. And we we're a brand new group and lots of change and churn. And we're trying to figure out how we plug into all of the other uh, organizations. And um, it took me about three or four months. But I finally decided I had to reorg and blow up the whole organization. Um, and when you do something like that, um, the benefit that you have is that you get to start from scratch. Um, and one thing that I did intentionally was we stood up sort of this, we call them operations, but they're really not operations. Um, they're really focused on agile methodologies. And um, I wanted to change the style of work. And so I think I mentioned briefly that we have a set of scrum masters. And you have to think about um, no project is too big or too small, um, but it's just a project unless it's managed um, very intentionally. And so um, all of those scrum masters now are assigned to each part of my organization. Um, and they are not only using, um, we set, rolled out a whole set of tools. Uh, we're now using Rike, um, for example, to manage all of our projects. And um, that person, that scrum master, is in charge of making sure that throughout that project cycle, every one of those teams is firing on what they need to deliver. And if they don't, then we review it in the weekly manager's meeting. Um, so I think setting up both your tool infrastructure is extremely important, and tools are different from technology in many, in many ways. Um, and then sort of your, your cadence and, and what is success. So we defined very early on that a project um, again, it's just a project unless we have sort of a set of KPIs and targets at the beginning um, and that those are, you know, being carried out. So, um, yeah. yeah. Terrific. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, Andy? Hi. Uh, my name is Andy Hanna. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. That was terrific. So as we enter into this um, cognitive era or we're in the cognitive era, uh, universities, especially large universities, have been around for hundreds of years. And so to make change, you need to make change in, in multiple different ways, but I'm, and, and that, uh, the implications are, are far reaching, uh, mm -hmm. from operations to how we get new students, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a central, I think, piece of the organization that's focused on how do we coordinate that. So what have yeah. you seen from a best practices perspective? across universities that say, okay, we're going to be a data-driven organization, an AI-driven organization. Mm -hmm. and, and so where does that, how, what's the best practice when, in, in guiding that North Star? Yeah. Oh, gosh. If I knew, I'd be rich. Um, <laughs> but what I can tell you is, you know, sort of that, that five-stage roadmap, I think, is really important that you do it and in that order. That organizational alignment is so important. And so if, if you have buy-in from the top and they say, you know what, yes, we're all on this journey to AI, 
from there, there's like a series of things that need to happen, and no part of the organization is any more important than, than the other. In fact, I would argue that the people who are managing your data centers, for example, the people who manage your IT infrastructure, it really should start there because they're the people who are going to be rolling out your tools. Um, and at IBM, you know, we are really on this path to developer. Um, and many people would say, well, a developer doesn't really buy anything. Well, it doesn't matter. The developer is the person who is using the technology. So if they don't have buy-in, they're going to go spin up their own instances over there. So I think really getting that, that, that layer um, committed to what you're trying to do um, at, the, at that very basic level is extremely important. Um, because if, if only the people up here who think that um, this is a great project, this is wonderful, um, you need the people to implement that and deploy it. So um, I think that that's really important. With that, please join me Thanks, again guys. in thanking Catherine. <laughs>